Professor Wynn, uh, uh, got her uh, undergraduate degree at McGill, another great uh, institution, I think. The Canadian <laughs> Yale, right? <laughs> Oh, no, Yale is the American It's the American McGill, that's right, that's right. How can I get that wrong? Um, you can still kind of hear the voice. Um, and, and for some reason, uh, you know, she loved the weather uh, in, uh, in uh, Montreal and Quebec City so much that uh, she went to Arizona <laughs> in her independent career. And we were lucky enough in 1990, I think it was, to convince her that uh, it was it was warm enough in New Haven. <laughs> don't don't make me older than I am, Kurt. <laughs> 1999, I came to Yale. Started yeah. Um, yeah. And has been here uh, since. Uh, and uh, so here you are, Professor. Well, thank you so much. Thank to Kurt for inviting me. Um, I love the Science Saturdays and I really um, am looking forward to just sharing some of the work that my colleagues and, and graduate students and postdocs and I have been doing here at Yale. And right from the, you know, to just start off, what I'm interested in these days is looking at, I mean, what I've always been interested in is looking at the fundamental structure of the human mind. How are we inherently built to understand the world, to make sense of what's going on around us, and to figure out you know, how to place ourselves in that world. And this is a very old question that's been around as long as the philosophers. And the particular question that I'm focusing on these days was put especially well by John Barth in the 1960s. Uh, I'm looking at the fundamentals of human nature. Is man a savage at heart, skinned over with fragile manners, just like gleaned on the surface after culture and education and uh, civilization? Or is savagery but a faint taint in the natural man's gentility, which erupts now and again like pimples on an angel's arse? So <laughs> this, is, this question has been around as long as the philosophers have been around. What are humans fundamentally? Are we fundamentally good? Are we fundamentally evil? And I've got a couple of quotes from you because people have been giving both answers as long as people have been around to pose this question. So Lao Tzu, who is, was an ancient Chinese philosopher and the founder of um, Taoism, believed that humans were fundamentally good. Every human being's essential nature is perfect and faultless, but after years of immersion in the world, we easily forget our roots and take on a counterfeit nature. Other people have not been quite so optimistic. Albert Einstein said famously, it's easier to denature plutonium than to denature the evil spirit of man. So this is what we're fundamentally um, asking. And I just want to say um, I very much welcome questions to come up as we go along. If you have questions about the scientific studies that I'm showing you or about the results or just if something's not clear, it's no sense listening to a talk where you're not actually understanding it. So I encourage you to just put up your hand if you have questions and we'll, we'll go along. And if it turns out we get into some interesting discussion and don't finish the official talk, that is totally fine with me. So just stick up your hand and if, if I don't see you, <coughs> you know, let me know that you've got a question. Um, how have I been choosing to address this, these types of questions about human nature? I've been, there's a lot of ways that one can do it. I've chosen in my professional life to study babies. Um, when I at least started, I, I um, was a graduate student at MIT and I started in the cognitive science program and I didn't start studying babies at first, I started studying preschoolers and then down to toddlers and I just became convinced there's a lot of interesting ideas and concepts that these young little children are bringing with them already. And that led me to study babies. And the reason I chose babies was because, um, and there's a baby in case you haven't seen a baby recently and want to know what they look like, you know. And the question is, how can babies help us <laughs> answer these types of questions? The reason I study babies is the story, the general idea of how we get to be the adult humans that we are 
is we start off, these are our minds as babies, somewhat not fully formed. And then we have all the tools of education and culture and learning and what our parents tell us and what our friends model for us and so on. And that, at the end of it, there we are, well-formed adults. So I'm really interested in what does this stuff look like at the very beginning? And I like to view the baby mind as a really good example of the human mind before it gets all of those corrupting influences of language and education. You know, this is the human mind as it is born, before it has had a whole lot of experience and learning. And, you know, it could look a lot like this, very unformed. But a lot of the studies that have been going on looking at babies' mental lives in the last few decades have found it may still be made of plasticine and have a lot of changes and updates that can be made to it, but it's got a lot of things already packed into it. So here's a um, magazine cover that was, came out on Life in about 1994, somewhere like that. It says they can add before they can count. Uh, that was actually my first baby study ever um, that, I, that I ran in 1992, when back in the days before time began. Uh, they can understand 100 words before they can speak, and at three months, their powers of memory are far greater than you ever imagined. We've learned a lot of things. So we've learned that babies actually have an ability to do some forms of arithmetic, believe it or not, We've learned they're born knowing what faces look like. You can take a baby that is one minute old, and they will rather look at a human face than almost anything else in the world. They're already built somehow in the uterus. They weren't, definitely weren't seeing faces in there. They have in their brains an idea of what the human face looks like, and people are so important to them that that's what they want to interact with and pay attention to more than anything else in the world. They're born recognizing their own language. And this relates closely to the follow. They can learn even while sleeping. So while they're sitting there having naps in mom's tummy, they are getting some noises that come through the abdomen wall and through the amniotic sac and the amniotic fluid. And they can actually hear mom's voice. And they can hear what language she's speaking. And become familiar with that language, the general sounds of it, and can tell it apart from another language. And they already know mom's voice when they're born. So they have a lot of powers of learning um, and a lot of rich, built-in types of knowledge or understanding or thought processes. And so it's these that I've been studying. And the particular questions that I've been focusing on in the last about decade are the early, what we might call the moral life of babies, questions of do babies recognize good um, from bad? And also, you know, what about their own natures? Are they born to be good or bad? So this brings us to the question of how do you actually study babies and get into their heads? Because if any of you have seen a baby recently, how many of you actually live with a baby? So you guys have definitely seen a baby recently. How many of you saw a baby recently? Yeah. So you know babies. Can babies run mazes like a rat? No. Can babies tell you about what they're thinking? Can you ask them? No. Because some babies, when they get old enough, like maybe after a year or most babies, like by the time they're 18 months, and I would say then they're, an 18 month old would not want to be called a baby. So I would stop calling them a baby by the time they could talk to me. But little babies, do little babies talk? <laughs> yep, they say things like brr, 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 brr. But they don't understand what you're asking um, them a lot of the time. They may understand some simple, simple stuff, but um, but they can't tell you uh, until they're about at least 18 months old on average. So how do you take somebody that can't talk and can't, you know, the way we study animals who can't talk in psychology is we put them in mazes or teach them to learn things like press a lever over here to get a food reward 
if you can tell that there's you know, greater than five, um, five light flashes, if we wanted to ask if, if rats can count. But babies can't even press, you know, they're not going to do that. So how do we get into the minds of babies? There's a few things that babies are really good at doing. Crying. They're good at crying. They're good at pooping. We don't measure those. We just, just made a decision early on. They're good at playing. They're good at playing. And they're good at some really, sorry? Sleeping. At sleeping. They're good at sleeping. They're good at a lot of things. One thing they can do right when they're born is they can open up their eyes and look at things. And they love, like I said, they love to pay more attention to some things than other things. And it turns out they love to pay attention to things that they really like, like faces. And once they have a couple days of experience with their mom's face or their dad's face, they'll love to look at those faces more than other things. And they also look longer, just like you might, at something that's unexpected or surprising to them. They'll look, you know, we may not see their eyebrows lift up. They're not going, oh my God, mom, what was that? But they don't say, do all that. But they do um, pay more attention to things that are unexpected or surprising to them. So we can l measure how long they look at different types of things. That was how I actually ran my baby addition and subtraction studies. I showed them one little doll going behind a screen, another little doll going behind a screen. How many dolls should be behind the screen? Two. Down comes the screen, and maybe there's two, but maybe there's only one, or maybe there's three. And we just measured how long are babies looking at these, and golly, don't you know what I found? Babies are looking longer when it's just one doll or when it's three dolls. They gave little short looking time when it was two dolls. So we used that to say, looks like babies are expecting two things to be there, and they're surprised when it's the wrong number. So that's one technique we can use. We measure babies looking to different things. A different measure is babies are good at liking some things more than others. And they're good, by the time they're about five months old, they're pretty good at reaching for toys or reaching for things they're interested in, which often aren't always toys, but maybe your keys or your cell phone, um, in direct proportion usually to how valuable and breakable they are or how deadly dangerous they are, right? The really sharp knife or the electrical cord. All those things babies love and are attracted to. So we can show babies situations um, and the, met, the stuff that I'm going to tell you about today mostly involves showing babies little puppet shows where the puppets behave in different types of ways. And then at the end of it, we ask babies, which puppet do you want to play with? And just use that. We're just asking them, who do they like better? The one who acted like this or the one who acted like that? So this will become really clear as I go along. Um, I have two parts to my talk because uh, we've got the nature of good and evil. So we've got the moral baby, and this is the first part. My colleagues and I, we were really interested in the question, do babies have any understanding of what it is to be nice and treat others well, or what it is to be mean and not treat others well? Do babies judge others by their behavior? So this is what we showed babies. I'm not going to, you just see it. You can be my subjects, even though you're not babies. but. Right, that's incident one. Okay, who wants to tell me what did you see happen there? Yeah. Exactly. That triangle was trying to get up the hill. The circle pushed him to be nice. The square pushed him to be mean. Did you, do you feel like you have a different attitude? Do you feel differently about the circle and about the square? If you had to pick one to play with, would you care which one? No? You'd like them both the same? 
you're a lot bigger than them, so they couldn't push you around, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Anybody else have anything you want to add? Mm -hmm. If I was going to play with, with any other the triangle. The triangle, the <laughs> one that was climbing. Uh-huh. <laughs> You, I like you. <laughs> All right, so we were really interested in little babies. Do they have different opinions about the helpful character and the unhelpful character? So we would, after seeing our situation, we just give babies a choice between the two characters. Now, what do you think? I'm going to ask you. You can be scientists right now put on your thinking hats do you think babies would have a different opinion about these two characters I think that they would pick the nice one uh-huh what about you again ah Whoa, good scientific thinking. What about you? All right, so you've got both the hypotheses out on the table. Maybe they know the difference, and if they can tell the difference, they'll like the nice one. If they can't tell the difference, they won't have a basis to pick. Um, I, think that, I think that they're going to care about the colors. So um, if they have a good experience with, with red, I think that they're going to go for the, for the square. But I'm pretty sure that they're going to have a, but I'm pretty sure that they're going to like the, the circle more because it was nice. To the, to the triangle and people, um, they feel, they feel, I don't know how to put it, but people, but people like to help those who are nice, but dislike those who are mean. Mm-hmm. So we've got a lot of things here, and I want to pick up on something that a couple of you said, because it's really important. Maybe babies do like red better than blue, or maybe most babies are right-handed, are going to pick the thing on the right. So, what do you think we would do to make sure our experiment was built to take care of those types of issues? You make sure that there was, that, that each possible, that each thing that they did would make sure that, there's, that there was a choice between, between each one. Like, if they were right handed, yeah. there would be like a square there. And that would have been one way to deal with the hand in this question. What we do, are, do you have an answer to this question or do you have a new question? Hmm? Okay. What is it? I think they would really like the circle. You think they would like the circle? Yeah. So what we did, the way we dealt with these concerns is for half of the babies, it's the red square that's the mean guy and the circle that's the nice guy. And for the other half of babies, it's the circle that's the blue circle that's the mean character and the red square that's the nice character. And for half of the babies, the nice character's on the left and the mean character's on the right. And for the other half of babies, it's the other way around. So if most babies like red more than blue. They might, most of them pick the red character. We'll see that, but we'll know it's only half the time that the red character is the good guy and the other half the red character is the bad guy. So this is called counterbalancing. We just make sure that other things babies might care about aren't going to be, um, aren't going to be, right, that we're going to be able to tell apart whether they're always picking the good character from whether they're always picking the red character. Yeah, did someone up there have another question? So if you turn the video upside down, the effects would be the opposite. I like that. I like that. So do you want to see what they do? 
All right, actually, before we even see what they do, I'm going to describe a couple other things to you. Some babies are too young to reach out for the objects. We've tested three-month-old babies, so we don't ask them to reach because they're too little. We ask them, who do you like to look at more? And babies tend to look at things that they, that they like. So here's a baby reaching. This baby saw exactly what you just saw. And this is a six-month-old. She's getting the choice. And that's what she does. Here's a couple other situations we've shown babies. Here's a character. Sees a nice toy inside of this box. So let's try to open the box. But he's not very good at opening the box, is he? Looks like he needs a little help. All right. What a nice gray kitty. And here he is again. He's going to try opening that box again. And what is the orange kitty going to do? <laughs> All right. And then here's one last type of situation we've shown babies. Okay, I've got a ball here. I'm playing with my ball. Oh, I'm going to invite you to play with me. Are you going to play back with me? We're taking turns here. Are you going to join in? Okay, so the orange bunny joined in the game and accepted the invitation to play. What about this green t-shirted bunny? What is this one going to do? Is he going to play with the other one? Now, is that friendly? Went away and took his ball. So for all of those, we ask, who does baby prefer? And here, I'm going to give you a chance to be the scientist, and you can code this baby. This is a three month, so she's looking. And you can just see an ear here from one of our puppets, and there's an ear that you'll be able to see in just a second. So she has two puppets in front of her. One of them was nice in one of our situations. One of them was mean. And now you can be the coders and see if you can tell which one is she looking at more. Oop. OK, play. Which one is she looking at? I knew this was going to happen. Which one is she looking at more? Are you ready? Here she goes. And for bonus points, you can even say, does she look like she might have a little bit of different emotional expression on her face? Does she smile more at one of them than the other? That's very hard to tell in little babies, though. All right. So that's, the kind, that's what our data looked like. How many of you thought she looked longer at this one? How many of you thought she looked longer at that one? Yeah, it's pretty, you know, we, all, we obviously we take a stopwatch and measure really carefully, but it's pretty, you know, we can, we can get, you know, babies like to look at these characters, and so we get a lot of looking from them. So here are the actual data. These are graphs, and the graph tells us what percent of all the babies looked longer at the, or, or reached for the nice character, that's the babies in blue, or the bad character. And the only thing you need to recognize in this graph is which is bigger, the blue bars or the red bars? The blue bars are way bigger because almost all of our babies about 85% of our babies reached for the nice character, or if they were three months old, looked longer at the nice character. And this, these bars just break it down by different ages and what different scenarios they saw. But it's the same pattern across all the babies. So how do we prevent experimenter bias? That is a really important question. We know that humans love to get what they want, right? 
and we have great powers of wishful thinking and we can even misperceive things and get it wrong we can think we're seeing what we want to see just because we want it so much so what we do is the experimenter who offers the toys to the baby doesn't know who's the nice character and who's the mean character they have no idea so they can't be thinking oh I hope she picks the red one I hope she picks the red one because if they were thinking that they might themselves smile more at the red one or even totally unconsciously tilt the board a little to make the red one just a little bit closer to the baby uh, and babies reaching is actually surprisingly hard for very young babies to do it's a lot of work and one toy being an inch closer than another doesn't sound like a lot but it could be a lot for a baby and they might reach for the close one well the experimenters can't do anything like that if they don't know which character is the nice one and which is the mean one all right turns out these judgments are really important to babies they don't just choose the nice character more than the bad character but um, they have a long memory for it a student in my lab Arbor Tassimi decided to see if you show babies one of these it was the box show a nice character helps open the box a mean one closes it will babies remember that a whole week later so we brought the babies into the lab a week later and only at that point did we give them the choice but babies are still choosing the good guy a week to ten days later saying that they really have remembered who's the nice character and who was the mean character all right well how much does it matter to babies are they willing to put their money where their mouth is now we know that babies by the time they're 10 months old and eating solid food they love cookies and graham crackers these are little graham crackers and babies are no dummies like I told you earlier if you give them a choice between one graham cracker on this plate and two graham crackers on this plate which one do you think they're gonna crawl to the two because they're no dummies just like you we're all no dummies we're like that's an easy choice what if it's puppets who are offering these two plates to the baby and what if the nice guy has a plate with just one cracker and offers just one cracker and it's the bad mean puppet who offers two okay who would you take a graham cracker from You'd take the, the one graham cracker? What about you? I would take the nice one because I would think that the mean one had done something not so nice to the uh -huh. Oh, the mean one. You couldn't, can't trust the mean one. Maybe he's done, maybe those crackers are suspect. What about you? Can you say it that again just a little bit louder? Because I couldn't hear from way back here. Mm-hmm. So the baby might not expect. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, shall we find out what the babies do? Do you want to know? we gave babies exactly this and most of the babies decided like a lot of you said they're gonna take the one cracker from the nice guy they're willing to give up a cracker just to not have to interact with that mean character okay what about this situation oh no you're gonna go for the eight yeah what do you who how many of you are going to now choose to accept the offering from the mean guy the eight crackers how many of you are there any of you that would still just take the one from the nice guy you guys are kind of mixed and you know what our babies were kind of mixed too more of them chose the eight crackers from the mean guy but still 
a third of our babies were still being holdouts and saying, not even for seven more crackers. Yeah. Because, say that, because of why? Because I know they're like just puppets, so like... Yeah, and you're a big guy. Like, if, if he gives you any trouble, you know, game over for him. He's picked the wrong, you know, you weigh about 100 times more. Yeah. yeah. Well, two-thirds of them chose the eight one, so you're right about most of them. But a third of them were still holdouts. So, Yeah. Um, in the first situation, they always chose the nice characters, about 85% of our babies. So there's always a few that chose the mean character, but the, the big majority always chose the nice characters in all our situations. Um, so I love these findings for two reasons. One, they tell us it really matters to babies. They're paying attention to how folks are treating others in the world, and that's really important to them. The other reason I love these findings is, hooray, even in infancy, there's a cost to being a jerk in the world. That jerk had to offer up a whole heap more um, in order to kind of get back into the good graces and have babies be willing to interact with him or her. We didn't, you know, we didn't ask, you know, we don't know what sex our puppets are, so him or her. And here, every now and then, a baby this is a young toddler, about 18 months of age, will actually spontaneously give an interaction. Um, watch what this kid does. So that was the mean puppet. He didn't like him. And sometimes, not too often, but sometimes babies will pick up one of them and hug them. And it's always been the nice character so far when they do that. So are these moral judgments? Well. They're certainly squarely in the domain of moral judgments. They're judging how, you know, they're judging an individual on the basis of how that individual treats someone else. That's, you know, that's the domain of moral assessment. And the other interesting thing about it is, okay, this, do you all recognize who this is? This is Lady Justice with her blindfold on. Why does she have a blindfold? Yeah, a blindfold and a balance scale, because she's unbiased. She doesn't know who's who. She's not paying attention to the particular identities. She's making her judgments the same for everybody. And our babies are unbiased in this sense. They don't have, you know, it's not that they're friends with one of the puppets beforehand. It's not that they themselves have been treated, sorry, I just banged my microphones. It's not that they themselves have just been treated nicely by one puppet and mean by another. They're watching interactions between strangers they've never met before, and even at three months, watching interactions between total strangers, it comes through loud and clear to them, this, is, this one's treating another nicely. This one's treating another badly. So I'd love to just end my talk here, um, because it's such a nice positive note. Um, babies, little angels, human nature is fundamentally good. Babies will save the world if we just give them, you know, if we just elect them to Capitol Hill, um, you know, they can set, solve all the world's problems and make there be world peace and put everything to rights again. But remember, there were two parts to my talk. And so, <laughs> here we come to part two. Now, this is the depressing part of the talk. Um, but I just want to say, from everything I've said so far, if you meet a baby and that baby's looking at you like this, I submit to you that it's not just gas, that that baby is making a judgment about you, and you so far have not fully impressed that baby. So you may want to up your game. You've got a very short window of time to you know, cause that baby to think a little better of you. They're making judgments all the time about people. All right, so for this part of my talk, I want to throw you out a question. There's all kinds of reasons why we might like some people more than others. What I've talked about so far is babies liking some people more than other people, puppets, people puppets, pu you know, characters more than others. 
on the basis of how they treat others. But there's other reasons we might like someone more than someone else. What are some of the reasons we like some people more than others, aside from their behavior? Yeah. If you've known them a little longer, absolutely. Familiarity is one important reason, um, important influence on our liking. And what about for new people that we just meet? Yeah, we know the world loves attractive people more than unattractive or plain or ugly people. There's all kinds of data showing that attractive people get better jobs and get paid more money. And, you know, we also are fortunate that we recognize that's not a thing we like and we try to correct for it. Um, but we, we do, you know, attractive people tend to be liked better. Are there other... Yeah. Maybe they're happy. We definitely like happy people better. People that are positive and make us feel good and just look like they're upbeat about the world, their attitudes. Definitely. There's all kinds of reasons. One of those many influences is we tend to like others who are similar to us in various ways. And the reason I chose this picture is just to point out and emphasize, it's not just humans who do this. It turns out preferring other individuals who are similar to yourself, we can find this tendency all across the animal kingdom, even fish. Of course, fish that are the same species often school together. But even within a school of the same species, there's some species of fish that make individual friends in their school and, the, and have their own fish buddies that they like to hang out with. And the fish buddies who are buddies with each other tend to be more similar than if you just took any two fish from the school at random. So we can find this across the animal kingdom, a tendency to like other individuals who share certain similarities with us ourselves. Um, and it turns out for adults, in, the, in psychology labs anyways, almost any similarity is sufficient to create some amount of preference. You can take adults and bring them into the lab and give them a quarter and tell them to throw it and it comes up heads or it comes up tails and then you tell them, well, some other folks came in and rolled this quarter and for some of them it came up heads and some of them it came up tails and now we don't do this explicitly. If we asked adults explicitly, who do you like better? I would hope that all of you would say, that's a stupid question. I'm not going to like someone better because they also threw a quarter and it came up tails just like when I threw it. But if you ask them not to make a conscious comparison, but just to make a judgment, let's just only ask you about the one that got tails just like you. How smart do you think that person is that you never met, you never even saw a picture, all you know about them is they got a tails just like you? Well, I don't know, maybe they're four points on a seven point scale, maybe that's how smart they are. Or I'm going to give you a dollar. How much of that dollar are you going to share with this other individual that you're never going to meet who also got a tail just like you? Oh, I guess I'll give them 50 cents. Another bunch of subjects you ask about the person who gave, got heads instead of tails. And oh, I guess they're three on a seven point scale of smart. And uh, maybe I'll give them 30 cents. So people aren't aware that they feel differently about um, individuals, but they do. And, and it doesn't matter what the similarity is. It can be such a stupid dimension as, did you throw a coin toss the same way? We like others who are similar to us um, and, and prefer them in a variety of ways that we can measure. So we were really interested in the origins of this. Is this something that we learn by being in a world where it's very important to affiliate with others who belong to our own social group? Um, or is this something that is a part of human nature from the get-go? So do babies like other individuals who are similar to them? Now, as one of you mentioned, we already know babies like others who they're familiar with. So we thought and thought, what is a dimension of similarity that won't just be familiarity? And we decided similarity of opinion. So our question is going to be, do babies like other people, puppets, who have the same opinion as the baby? So here's a baby. We're going to ask this baby's opinion about two toys. There's a green car. There's a yellow helicopter. 
And she has just expressed that she likes the yellow helicopter better. So we can ask, now that, ba you know, this baby likes the yellow helicopter, does she like, she's now going to get introduced to two puppets. One of them likes the yellow helicopter but not the green car. One of them likes the green car but not the yellow helicopter. Here's what that looks like. You can see it down in the bottom here. <laughs> okay, and then the other puppet just does the opposite and likes the other toy. So now we ask, who does the baby like? Now she gets to choose. Okay. And, and what we find well, first of all, let me tell you, we've done it with toys. Which toy do you like better? We've done it with mittens. Look, we've got orange mittens and yellow mittens. Which mittens would you like to wear, baby? And they pick, and we'll put the mittens on their hands. And then the two puppets each say, oh, I like this one, but not that one. So we put mittens on the two puppets' hands, and babies get to choose between the two puppets. We've done it with foods. We've done it with two foods where ba we know babies like one of them more than the other. Which one do you think they like more than the other? The graham crackers. The graham crackers. Yep. And we've done it with foods where we know babies feel the same about them both. Babies love graham crackers and they also love Cheerios. And here's what we find. Any guesses? The ones that are similar are the ones that It'd be seems to go down the wrong way if babies would actually prefer the one that was different, dissimilar, right? They might either have no preference or they might prefer the one that's similar. Does anybody have any different intuitions? Yeah? yeah. yeah? Oh. That's an interesting. So if, if the puppets then chose something else, the baby would pick the thing that the similar puppet chose? We haven't done that. That is a great idea for a study. You want to join my lab? <laughs> you think about it. Let me know in five years, maybe 10. Um, so here is what the babies actually do. Blue is the number of babies who chose the puppet that had the same view as them and picked the same object. And red is the ones who chose um, the babies who chose the one that was different. And you can see babies are picking the similar guy. And this was with 7-month-olds and 11-month-olds. So they're picking the other puppet that has the same views as them. Um, and about 83% altogether. So, okay, well, that's fair enough, right? Most of us, when we think about why we decide to be, what makes us want to be friends with somebody more than another, almost all of us, we have something, it's because we have something in common with them. We, it's natural to choose friends because we have common shared interests. Why might we be built this way? What's, what's the advantage of having this be a fundamental part of human nature, so fundamental that we don't even have to learn it but are born with it and can show it by the time we're just a few months old. I think there's a few different reasons why it might be useful. First of all, if you like raspberries and someone else likes raspberries, you're going to be going to the same places. You might know a patch that she doesn't know about, and she might know a patch that you don't know about, so you might benefit by sharing information and strategies with each other. And by joining forces, maybe you can collect more raspberries than otherwise. Sometimes you may not actually care about the person's preference itself, but the fact that they have the same view as you on something is an indication that they belong to a similar group as you. Now, in, in these days, we tend to like a whole lot of international cuisines, so um, it's not as strong of a cue as it used to be, but even so, if you meet someone and they like a plate of fried spiders, 
which people do eat in places in the world. Um, I grew up in a place where we never ate fried spiders. And I, I've missed my window of opportunity to develop a taste for them because they just, you know, I would just, I'd run away. I'd run out of the restaurant and down the street. I'm not going to eat them. If I meet someone who loves a plate of fried spiders, probably they grew up in a different culture than I did and come from somewhere far away and aren't, you know, didn't originate from my group of people, my peeps. And we don't necessarily like this about humans, that we tend to prefer individuals that belong to our own groups, but this is very powerful force around the world. And even if it's something that you don't care about by itself, it's fine with me if someone has this taste or that taste. The fact that it's the same as yours or different from yours may tell you something important about what community that person belongs to. And then the other reason is this is how special interest groups get formed. We've been a very social species for as long as humans have existed. We've not only had to have conflict with different groups of people that are different cultures and different ethnicities and different races living in different countries, the ones that we commit war and fight with and genocide and all of that, but we've also had to argue and get our own way within the community within which we live. There's always been politics. There's always been us having to decide to go get the big game in our hunting. Are we going to go upriver or are we going to go downriver? And some people think we'll one and some think the other. And they have to get together and try to convince everybody they're right. So most of the adults in the audience, if you're at work and have like faculty meetings or group meetings where the group has to decide something, you know, pick your group uh, where, where you have to get together with other adults and decide things and there's different opinions and you can find people sorting and try, collecting together in big group, you know, gathering everybody that's of the same view as them to try to, you know, convince the others and get their way. So there's a lot of reasons why it might be useful to be attentive to whether others are similar to ourselves. But like I said, it's fair enough to choose your friends that way. We don't, you know, some people actually choose their friends because they're different and new. Um, but when we see most of our babies choosing the similar, there's nothing bad about that all by itself. But if we ask babies, how do you want these other individuals to be treated? That's where we start to say, OK, we, as a reflective species, who does have moral ideas, we can say individuals shouldn't be treated differently just because, you know, the person who likes graham crackers just like me shouldn't be treated differently than the one who likes Cheerios instead, right? So how did we ask this question? Well, babies come into our lab, they choose between two things, then they get introduced to the two puppets. One chooses the same as the baby. The other chooses the opposite. And then, for half the babies, it's the one who chose the same as the baby. Say the one who chose the graham crackers is trying to open our box. And somebody's nice and helps them open the box. And somebody's mean and slams the box lid shut. So we ask babies, who do you like between the helper and hinder? The one that was nice to the guy similar to you or the one that was mean? And of course, for the other half of babies, it's the character who chose differently from the baby, the one who chose green beans that's trying to open the box. And someone's helpful, and someone slams the box lid shut. And we ask those babies, who do you like more? The one that was nice to the one that was different from you, or the one that was mean? Or maybe you don't have a preference at all. So what do you think? What do you think babies are going to do? What about when it's the puppet that's like me, that chose the same as the baby? Who do you think they're going to like? The one that helped it? The one that pushed the box lid shut? Or they don't care? Yeah? The one that helped it. Let's see. You are right. Uh, babies, just as strong as always, preferred the nice guy. What do you think about when it's the puppet who chose different from the baby? That they'll choose the helper. Because it's nice to be a nice person. What do you think? I think that they'll choose the hinderer because if it's something they don't like and the hinderer is helping them get to the decision that they don't like that, then they're going to choose that person because it's helping them. 
So maybe they'll choose the hinder. And what about you? Helper? Shall we see? I was really disappointed. I wanted to go take all my babies and have a little talk with them. I was very sad to find that just because they liked the graham cracker and the other puppet liked the green beans, they actually liked the puppet who was mean to that one. Um, so, there's a little hole in Lady Justice's blindfold. She's, you know, babies are, can make judgments as disinterested bystanders, but they're not totally disinterested. They're letting other facts flow through. We also wanted to know, do babies have different expectations about these characters? So this is the one study we ran that used looking time. Remember, babies tend to look longer at things that are surprising to them. So when we showed them the similar character who chose the same as the baby, being nice to somebody and being mean, they looked a lot longer when that character was mean, suggesting they were surprised by that and expected the one with the same, the one with the same view as them to be nice. But they didn't have any idea. Uh, they didn't look longer when it was the character who chose differently from them. It's like, you're different, you're foreign and unknowable, and I can have no expectations about you. So I want to sort of wrap up now. And first of all, what does all of this stuff say about babies? Well, in a nutshell, it says that babies are smarter than you think. There's a lot of detailed evaluation of the world and attention to details and a lot of judgments going on in their heads, even in the very first months of life. But the bigger question is, what does all this say about us as humans? I started out studying babies not because I was interested in babies, though actually now I'm... Long uh, decades after I started, I'm really interested in babies now and think they're actually very, very interesting, special subtype of humans on their own. But I started because I was really interested in what's human nature. Well, one thing that this says is that we can now answer John Barr's question and say, we're neither just good nor just bad as our fundamental human nature. We've got both, both sides of the coin of human nature. We are both good and bad. Um, even from birth, we can see the ability to distinguish nice from mean and to prefer individuals who treat others well. But we can also see forms of bias that intrude in ways that we don't want um, our society to be governed by. So we've got built-in ideas of nice and mean. We've got built-in attitudes towards individuals who are like me and individuals who are different from me. And when you're talking about a three-month-old or a seven-month-old, these notions have not been instilled in them through learning and education and culture. They they came with the baby. They, came, they come with us, probably in our DNA hardwiring. All right. Well, like I said, I was disappointed in those babies that actually were like, eat me to the one that chose different from them. I like someone who's mean to you. We would like our, our whole world to have people get along, recognize our differences, and not get into all kinds of skirmishes and wars and traumatic, difficult conflicts over these differences. So is there anything that studying babies could possibly have to say? Could it be helpful at all in this type of endeavor? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That is such a great question. In case you didn't hear, would ba do babies like other babies more than a fully grown humans? How many of you have a little baby brother or sister at home? 
And how many of you are you, your baby brother or sister's favorite person in the family? <laughs> well, you know, it turns out it's a complicated question, right? Because maybe mom or dad is the favorite person when the baby's hungry, but maybe you're the favorite person when the baby wants to play. Um, we do know that a lot of babies seem to be very attracted to other kids. Maybe not other babies, but other kids that are a few years older to them. And I think that this may be actually one of the ways that development happens, is that kids of all ages are especially intrigued and attracted to kids who are just a little bit older than them, a little bit further on the developmental scale. You know, they've got know how to do a few more things, and they're cool. And, you know, when you think of who do you want to be like, who do you want to dress like, who do you want to act like, often kids are looking up just a little to the age just above them. And that may be how we <laughs> aspire to and end up becoming adults um, and being driven to, to always be looking forward. So, all right, so can findings from babies be helpful? If we have a core liking for similar and a dislike of different, we can ask questions like, what is the effect of highlighting all the diversity of humankind? We know a lot of schools are really paying attention to this question and want to have, encourage tolerance for and appreciation of diversity. But there might be a real difference between simply saying, look, we've got all these different kinds of people in the world that do things differently, versus saying, look, everybody's really similar in these important fundamental ways. We all love our family members. We all love a good meal around the family table, and so on. And it might be that these two things, these two types of messages, behave very, very differently and are received very differently by a system that is built to value similarity and to devalue difference. So I'm going to end there. And I will take questions. But any of you who have to leave, feel free to leave. Um, but that is the end of my official talk. I'm just sensitive to the fact that we're just about at noon now. So I know we're at the end of our official time. <laughs> But I'm, I'm happy to take questions from anybody that has more questions they want to ask. You had a question. You had your hand up. I saw you. Don't want to ask it now? You're all done? Okay. Not as rapidly, no. And they can change their imprint. But that, that helps them determine what's similar? Well, there's, they definitely like what's similar to what they know and what's familiar. So if you, right. if you look like my parent, you're on the ins. You're on the ins. Yep, yep. Well, you should do this with all the political candidates in the debate. <laughs> Use babies to tell us who to vote for. Yeah, <laughs> it yeah. It might be as good a system as anything. All right, well, okay, thank you all very much. <laughs>